This is a story about a woman in Virginia named Temple. Temple is deeply attached to her family's mansion. It's an old plantation with deep, unsettling secrets. The story is about how Temple gets wrapped up in exposing these family secrets as a way to save the place. And then she begins to question whether it's worth saving. And so it's, it's about that arc of her understanding of what the right thing to do is and who, who is her touch point for what that right thing is. And that changes throughout the book and changes her. We're talking with author Heidi Hackford about her new novel, Folly Park, on this Desideratum. Desideratum means something you desire, something for you that's essential. The essential thing we're celebrating here is storytelling, with authors and with narrators. We're going to talk about their stories and listen to a few minutes from their audiobooks. I'm Teresa Bakken, an audiobook narrator, and I hope you'll hear a story you want more of and that you'll find a new favorite wordsmith to follow. Where did the title come from? Was it something after you finished researching and writing that felt appropriate or was it a starting point? It was sort of the starting point. I had read about Follies and then seen a few of them. Um, I was working at Monticello and so touring a lot of historic homes around the area. And I, I just thought they were so strange. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to interrupt with a quick definition. A folly you might think of as a foolish thing. But folly is also a word for a costly, ornamental building with no practical purpose built in a large garden or park. I just thought they were so strange. Yeah. Um, and then the sort of irony for me about uh, being a plantation home and having these sort of whimsical creations that were probably built by the slaves. So for example, there's a, a mill at Folly Park that's supposed to be sort of a rustic mill and it's supposed to stand for the virtues of pastoral country life. And you just think there's something just sadly and tragically ironic about this kind of a thing. So it was sort of a play on that. And then I kind of see the house itself as a folly, sort of a nation-sized folly, <laughs> symbolizing you know, the mistake, the tragic mistake of slavery. I liked the play on words for that, both the, the building and then also an act of folly. Yeah, I think, honestly, I think for me, you've done that in a lot of different ways. You've used plays on words and deeper meanings behind things. Even the characters talk about the importance of semantics. There are moments where someone will correct, these are guests, not tourists. Like the way that we're going to frame our thinking around the people coming into the house is that they're guests, not tourists. And I think the other one I wrote down was, they were servants, not slaves. The language was part of the storytelling, was part of the facade, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that we found, I mean, probably going back about 20 years, I, a lot of places have changed and updated now, but I know Mount Vernon still had on their signage not that long ago, you know, the servants lived here, the servants did this and that. And it's, it's really jarring when you realize that, wait, they're, they're not talking about paid maids and butlers and things like that. Like these were enslaved people. Um, and even the language around that, you know, we, we try not to call people slaves anymore. That's not their identity. You know, they were people who were enslaved. And so that language has changed a lot. Just even within the last few years, I mean, started this book about 15, 20 years ago. It's been long in the, in the making. <laughs> so it's really evolved. You know, I've actually had to change some of that language as, as it has changed as well. That's so interesting that this has been percolating with you for that long. Mm -hmm because it feels so current to me. It feels very timely. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, to be honest, it was a little intimidating. I mean, I kinda, the, the inspiration for the book, I think, or the germ of the idea was when I was working at Monticello and I had started there a couple of years right after the, the um, DNA 
results came out showing that a Jefferson male had fathered enslaved woman Sally Hemings' children, and Jefferson didn't have direct male descendants. So there, some some historians chose to believe that well, that could have been his brother. <laughs> but the foundation at the time, which was very uh, controversial when they did it, they they looked at all of the evidence, oral histories from the slave quarters, and evidence from Jefferson's journals about when we, he was at Monticello and could have been with Sally Hemings and how much later after that they were born and everything. So they took all of that together and took the position that we believe that Jefferson fathered all of Sally Hemings' children. And it was really, I think what hit for me was that some of the docents actually quit over that stance. And that idea that your own identity could be some, become so wrapped up in a person in the past that you felt that you knew it just made me realize that we just, we can identify so closely with a past that we can't really know. Yeah. And so that, that sort of was the sort of germ of that idea that I just sort of kept teasing out and rolling around in my head for many years. <laughs> yeah. I'm really glad that you brought up journals and the way that Monticello validated, right? Cause you in this story have used a diary literally falls out of the ceiling onto our main character. And she is then sort of gifted this window into the past through this date by date diary. But also um, the characters are using letters from the past to sort of reconstruct things. And there's actual research going on in the book to help find truths. And the letters are really um, real to me for that time period. So you were working in Monticello and you knew of that sort of research. Mm -hmm. How did you construct that kind of paper trail for this book, for this fiction? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think um, at Jefferson, at Monticello, I worked on Jefferson's family letters. So he lived with a lot of his grandchildren. He had 11 grandchildren with his um, one daughter and they all, he lived with them at Monticello and the sisters would write back and forth between each other. So I, there's something I love about the language and the voice from that time period, which was really interesting to me. So it was fun to try to recreate that. But then I also, you know, have a PhD in history, so I'm, I'm aware of sort of all the possibilities of places where there can be <laughs> information. And I think to some degree, it, I imagine this, you know, moldy old archives in the basement of this house that has all this amazing stuff, which is probably never going to happen. <laughs> you know, you usually have to really dig around for things and go to different places and, and really uncover rocks. You know, it's sort of my idealized version of like how, what would it be like if there actually everything was, or a lot of things that could really pull the whole story together were there. I can feel your love of that kind of history reading this book. Um, there's actually, there's a, there's a description of a library research room, although you just said a moldy old basement, which there is a lot in a moldy old basement in the story. But there's also this, there's a description about an area where there are rare books. Mm -hmm. And our main character Temple says that she always felt removed from present time and cocooned in the past there. The floor was covered with forest green carpet, so thick it hushed all sound. Um, you talk about mahogany table, even this sort of thrill of anticipation as the metal cart and the archival boxes um, come rolling at her. So there's definitely a passion for history and the preservation of those things running through this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that actually the the um, that particular library was modeled on the undergrad library where I went <laughs> to study. I, I was not a history undergrad, but I loved it so much I would go to that library to study. It was at Cornell University, and it was this sort of uh, it hadn't been updated in years, so they had these little lamps that you could hardly see by, <laughs> but it did have that kind of carpet, and you just felt like you were completely removed from the rest of campus while you were there. And I kind of fell in love with it, and so. I've always appreciated that feeling and, and definitely when you do archival research, where, especially in special collections where you have to kind of wait for them to bring you things, there's that sense of anticipation and when the cart's coming towards you, you're hoping that there's lots of boxes on it and not just one letter. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, for uh, geeking out for historians, it's, <laughs> it's a really exciting moment. Yeah, that's sort of juxtaposed in this story. So we're, we're living kind of in the past, we're reading these letters, we're finding out, we're uncovering things that happened in the past. And simultaneously in the present, you have um, a political race 
and um, a town just sort of entrenched in history mm-hmm. as they know it. It's a juxtaposition, it's an irony to me because you see people sort of resisting. And I, it's a, it was a be- really beautiful way, I think, to demonstrate that sort of love of the past and, and unearthing that history, and yet a resistance to it, an unwillingness to accept. You capture that in your, you have a dedication, uh, you dedicated it to your dad, but also you start with a quote. Can you talk a little bit about the quote that you started the book with? Yeah, I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois was a really amazing Black scholar. Um, it was the first Black man to graduate from Harvard and a degree with a degree in sociology, and he had a very, very long career. And he w- wrote a, a really famous work on Reconstruction long before sort of any other white historians had tackled that period. And for a long time, it was sort of viewed as, oh, this Reconstruction was a mistake, and all of these carpetbaggers came down from the north and took advantage of these innocent, you know, naive black people. And and it was a disaster for the south. And then, you know, it finally ended after 10 years. And, and only within the last few decades have have we sort of returned to understanding that Du Bois actually had it right that, you know, we had systemic racism. And it was just this entrenched um, racism that was going to defeat it no matter what. And so, he was really prescient and kind of saying this is what was going on and sort of nobody really listened, but it's it's a classic now. And I love how he kind of says, you know, history is really messy. Nation building is messy. We keep trying. And it's just really important to keep bringing out the truth. We owe it to the future to be able to do that. So I thought that was just a really powerful way of expressing kind of what my book is about. It's really messy. Let's engage with the mess. <laughs> And you play around a little bit with the facade again of the plantation. Like we are, we're looking at this historic building from the outside and it's preserved very well, but the interior is, it's rotten. I think there's a termite infestation. There's literally in the very first pages, things are crumbling. Mm -hmm. You do it a couple of times. There's even a portrait with a lemon slice. (laughs) Was that based on anything historic? Yeah, no, I just, I know that art uses a lot of motifs. I was trying to play on how in that scene, the two two people looking at her, one of them is not very sympathetic to her and sees all of those motifs and thinks she seems really spoiled. And even her expression looks spoiled while the other person who's more sympathetic is bringing her perspective to it and sees her as looking sad. And so sort of a commentary on the whole book, you know, even to history, we bring our own experiences and our own feelings and thoughts and desires to the interpretation that we have of it and, you know, what's right. Could you talk about the two women in this story that you're telling the story through? You just touched on it a little bit, how they're both sort of seeing things through their own lens and how their intersection is at the heart of this story, really. Yeah, I I think I'll start by saying that I actually had a really hard time with Temple, the main character, and that's partly why the book took me so long. I, you know, it started out with a very privileged white woman from the South, and I I didn't like her. (laughs) Um, And so there were, she just went through many, many iterations where I just kept trying to make her somebody that I would want to be around um, and that I could sympathize with and that I could take her experience and who she was, but actually make her grapple with it in a way that I could sympathize with and that I would end up liking her. And so one of the ways that I ended up doing that was was to bring V in, who is a, a Black scholar, and they have a lot in common as far as their interest and their their sort of approach to scholarship and their love of history. And so having V there allowed me to see how, as she reacts to V, she can grow as a person and really see what what it looks like for her to be who she is and to be doing what she's trying to do to someone who she cares about and is interested in and relates to. And so it just it helped me kind of flesh both of them out to have them together as sort of oils. And that relationship ended up being really integral, I think, to, to them and what happens with the story. It's difficult to inherit the sins of the past. Yeah. And those are the debates we're having about about plantations and monuments and what we celebrate from the past. Yeah. And, you know, having lived in the South, I'm shocked at how quickly it's changing now. I mean, 
it's been the same for a very long time. And when you live there and you move there from the north and you're not sort of part of it, it just feels like it's set in stone, no pun intended. <laughs> and then to see, you know, monuments coming down in Richmond is is really, really powerful and, and really surprising to me. It's it's amazing. Of course, then there's the backlash, which you know we're also dealing with. Yes, you play a little bit of the backlash in this. You write about kind of what she's up against, and there's even moments where you can see rhetoric um, whipping people up. I don't want to spoil, like I don't want to say. And then Temple in the end, you know. <laughs> okay, let's stop right here and listen to some of Heidi's storytelling. What you're going to hear is one of the moments from the book where a disturbing family secret is revealed. The secret is spelled out in a letter, a letter that dates back to the 1830s. This is from Folly Park, written by Heidi Hackford, published by She Writes Press. V consulted her yellow pad, but Temple could tell she was just using her notes to avoid looking at her. King and his twin sister, Linda, were born at Folly Park in 1821. Their mother was described as a bright or light-complexioned slave named Maria. The tax list groups slaves by family unit, and it looks like Maria didn't have a slave husband. V adjusted her glasses. But... She gave birth to 13 children in 15 years, before she died in childbirth at the age of 34. That's a lot of children. Yes, it's interesting. V's voice was oddly toneless. I was going through the plantation documents in those unprocessed boxes, and I found a series of letters dating from the 1820s and 30s. They were from the general's father in Louisiana, Thomas Smith Sr., to his brother James, here at Folly Park. I know about those. They talk about how James occasionally sent slaves to his brother's plantation, right? Yes, but Thomas Sr. didn't keep the slaves. He sold them as soon as he got them. Prime field hands were lucrative in the Deep South. They weren't field hands, V said. And he sold all of them to the same New Orleans slave trader, T.R. Vicente. Well, all but one, she added. So, what? I'm not following. T.R. Vicente only dealt in girls. I compiled the names and ages of slaves sent from Folly Park to Louisiana over a 15-year period. They were all girls, between the ages of 10 and 16. Nine of them, including King's sister Linda, were Maria's daughters. V looked at Temple expectantly. Temple frowned. What exactly are you saying? I think... James Smith sent his brother slave girls from Folly Park to be sold into prostitution. James would have gotten thousands of dollars for the girls, especially if they were light-skinned. V glanced down at her pad again. I think he may have been the father of some, if not all of them. Temple couldn't speak. She felt numb. I'm sorry, but there's more. Temple's voice came out in a croak. What? It's in the last few letters. Thomas Sr. kept Linda for himself. Apparently, he never paid James for her. V handed Temple a folder. Inside was a letter. Moray Parish, Louisiana, February 25th, 1836. My dear brother, you write to me in an uncharitable spirit. I have remitted to you every dime that Vicente gave me for the last lot of pickaninnies you sent down. True, the sum is something short, unaccounted for even by the deduction of my share, as you have so 
sharply noted. As you suspect, they were not all sold. None was lost to disease or accident during the journey, as you fear, however. Certainly not Linda, in whom you take such particular interest as to single her out in your inquiries. It will shock you to learn, I am sure, that she is fair along in a breeding way, and as Vicente would not have her, useless as she now is for his business, I have retained her as a nursemaid. Antoinette is again in a delicate state of expectation, and nearly overcome by the care of the two screaming infants already in residence. I will give you a fair price for Linda when I have funds, which I frankly confess may be delayed. As I do, you so charitably point out, suffer from the vice of gambling. Your other aspersion upon my character brings to mind the idea of the pot calling the kettle black. You need not remind me of the impropriety of retaining any of Maria's girls to sport with, dear brother, particularly the lovely Linda. Whether such relationship as you imply exists between myself and herself is as unnatural between uncle and niece as between father and daughter, I leave to your superior moral sense. Our Linda, indeed, has become an indispensable addition to the family circle, and her new master, no less than her new mistress, finds her eager desire to please a most refreshing quality, for such training of which we are deeply grateful to her previous master. I remain your most appreciative brother, Thomas T. Smith. The name of the podcast is Desideratum, which is Latin for the desire for essential things. So for me, starting it had to do with finding story to be essential and wanting to spend time with storytellers. So I like to ask for you, what is essential? What do you think is most essential? In life or in reading or in books or? So the other background is it came from a poem. I don't know if you're familiar with it. There's a poem called Desiderata. It's all these essential things. It starts with go placidly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. And then it's just full after that of things that, that we should value as essential. So you could answer it as a writer or as a researcher, a historian, um, or just as a person. I love that. I mean, it's, it's an amazing poem and, and there's so many things going through my head. I mean, I feel like of course, I'm a writer. I love books. I can't imagine living without books. <laughs> and I've always gravitated to history. And I, th I think I've been fascinated just from a very early age on how history just turns up in, in everyday life all the time. And so, yeah. and, if, and if we are willing to kind of see it and to grapple with it and how it can help us grow as people and understand ourselves better and and so, I mean, I'll say history books, <laughs> um, which is probably obvious, but um, yeah, I couldn't, I could not live without them. I think you're the first person to ever say that. And yet I'll bet every single author I've had has done some sort of historical research <laughs> and probably would say it is essential. Yeah. Understanding the past, also revisiting the past, right? I think that's really part of the essence of this story is we think we know the story. Mm -hmm. The story has been written. Here it is. Here's our history. And oh, we're so proud of it. We can go back generations. We can name the names, generations in our family that have lived on this land, that have had this place in this history. Mm -hmm. And yet there are, there are parts of the story that still haven't been told. No, and, and every time you discover something new, it allows you to sort of reimagine your own identity. You know, if you're, if you're going to identify with the past or with people in your family or where you grew up or the house that you love or any of that stuff, it, it has to, 
I don't know, I, I think to have any integrity, it has to be questioned all of the time and to be reevaluated. And, and, I, and I find that exciting. I think that's, that's wonderful to think that we have that sort of power to be able to rethink who we are and to continue to really engage with issues and things that come up and historical things that come up and then determine how we're going to respond. Yeah. Yeah. But it informs who we are today. Exactly. Yeah. One of the things I kept thinking while I was reading all the letters in your book was for the present that we're living, when we are the past, what will people unearth? What will people look for? Yeah, and there's there's so much information. I mean, and you think about social media and young people today who have these massive data points, right, of what they were interested at different times. And, and it's, it is fascinating. I, I was remembering as I was thinking about talking to you today that we had some interns when I worked at the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, and we were transcribing letters, handwritten letters, you know, they had to type them in, and they had a really hard time with the handwriting because they don't have to read it anymore. They're not taught it in school. Yes. And so we ended up having, rather than the interns who were st really struggled with it, we had a, a person who had worked for the CIA and been an analyst. <laughs> and she loved it because it was like, it was, it almost became a puzzle. You know, what does this actually say? What does this person say? And, yeah. and it's, I think it's a, a skill that's been lost. And hopefully, I don't, I don't know if it will ever come back again. I mean, we have, we have vinyl back. We never thought we had that. So, right. <laughs> There are so many data points too, though, right? And there's, and there's such a curation of image yeah. mm -hmm. through social media that uh, I think some of the things in these letters are, are just so deeply personal too, that people put in, in written form to a loved one far away, mm -hmm. their deepest fears, their, like there's the one I wrote down from Carolina that I loved was that she's always learning. She calls them daily skirmishes with self-improvement. <laughs> That's a wonderful turn of phrase. <laughs> Thanks. I like that. I want to thank Folly Parks publisher, She Writes Press, and Heidi Hackford for sharing Temple and V and this story full of history and surprises with me. I'll put their links in the show notes. I would love to hear what you think about Folly Park. Reach out anytime on social media or by email. I'm tbnarrator at gmail.com. As always, thanks for being here, and thanks for listening. <laughs>